Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Jerry B. Brown. Jerry is an anthropologist, an activist, and an author. He received his doctorate in anthropology from Cornell University in 1972, and until 2014, he served as the founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami. Here, in 1975, he started offering a pioneering course in hallucinogens and culture. More recently, he's performed field work exploring the possibility that psychoactive mushrooms may have played a hidden role in Christianity, and that their use is depicted in Christian art. This is documented in his book, The Psychedelic Gospels, which is co-authored with his wife, Julie, and it's what we talk about today. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, so I'm here with Jerry Brown. Jerry, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. So maybe we could begin with how you first became interested in psychedelics and the link to religion. Well, that really goes back to 1973 when I experienced my first LSD session, not really a session, but it was high in the Rocky Mountain National Park of Colorado at a rainbow family gathering of some 5,000 people. And I was really, I did not have a enlightened experience. I didn't see God to be sure. Um, no instant nirvana, nothing that you know Leary and uh, Ramdas were talking about. I was kind of spun out and this was me. I was in a very uh, unstable period in my life. You know we knew nothing about set and setting in those days. I was uh, I was you know I knew I was uh, gonna be getting a divorce. I had left a very powerful social movement that had defined my life. I was kind of betwixt in between. And I was um, reading the Carlos Castaneda books and I I was spun out into a very paranoid world. That frightened me. And I realized that um, these are very powerful drugs, this LSD. And being an anthropologist, I decided I wanna learn more, a lot more about this. And as they say, if you want to uh, learn something, you should teach it. So uh, being a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, I designed a course on hallucinogens and culture, now called psychedelics and culture, and put it in the catalog. And that was my first real, and and through that, it wasn't a just say no course. It wasn't like all drugs are good uh, kind of course it was. I was looking at well-documented case studies, landmarks in the study of psychedelics and culture, including obviously Gordon Wasson's um, seminal works in the field of ethnomycology. So that was my introduction to it. Uh, The course went on for decades and I was reading all the time, absorbing everything I could in the field. In the field, anthropology is an interdisciplinary field in and of itself. It uses an interdisciplinary approach. And certainly the study of psychedelics takes you into many different fields, classical languages, church history, theology, ethnobotany, ethnomycology, the way uh, people, cultures use mushrooms, art history, linguistics, So I was um, absorbing a lot of this. Uh, I found it fascinating that my, and this was starting out in the drug war years of President Richard Nixon, 1970s Controlled Substance Act. Practically everything was made illegal and and Leary was the most dangerous man in America. If only that were our biggest problem today. Um, So that was my introduction and I read voraciously in the field. Then in 2006, on a uh, anniversary trip to Scotland, uh, Julie and I visited Roslyn Chapel, which is a Christian church built in the 15th century by uh, Sir William Sinclair. And uh, we were drawn there by Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code which mentioned Roslyn as one of the possible resting places of the Holy Grail. Well, Roslyn, although a Catholic church built for the celebration of the mass, is a unique fusion of pagan and Catholic symbolism. And woven through the church on a long, sinuous, sculpted stone vine are over a hundred green men. 
uh, fertility faces from the Middle Ages and, and earlier. And I was impressed by the most prominent green man of Roslyn, whose face came down from a 15 foot stone boss from the ceiling. So you looked up at it. And I found a plaster replica of this green man head in the Roslyn gift store. I bought it. And two weeks later, Julie and I are sitting in an Italian restaurant in St. Andrews, Scotland. And I turn this green man head around on the table and I am looking at Upside down, I see that an Amanita muscaria mushroom has been sculpted upside down into the forehead of this green man. This, and we found certain other psychedelic references in Roslyn. And this started our mind spinning. What was Sir William St. Clair who was, oversaw every detail of everything that went into Rosin, was he trying to tell us that psychedelics were part of the ritual? Were there other psychedelics throughout Catholicism? Could this go back to the time of Jesus and the disciples? And our minds were now racing in a, almost a rambunctious overthrow of reason. And at this point, we remembered the words of uh, Carl Sagan, the astrophysicist, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, and Julie and I, my wife, co-author, partner, um, photographer of all the images in our book, wrestled with this for six years. Um, it would be expensive. We didn't know if we'd find anything else. It'd be time consuming. It'd be controversial if we did find anything. And we finally came to a point where we said, given what we know, given what's been given to us, and I think it was Pascal who said, chance favors the prepared mind. I mean, why in 500 years of Rosalind's history did no theologian, no art historian, no church historian, no tour guide ever notice this? It was because I was steeped in mushroom lore and mushroom images from my teachings and readings that I was able to recognize it. Uh, along the way, when we were writing our book, where we finally published all of our results in our book, The Psychedelic Gospels, and this is to cover the secret history of hallucinogens in Christianity. Uh, we spent some time with the famous mycologist, Paul Stamets, and I showed him this green man head and he said, that's a taxonomically correct Amanita muscaria. And you can quote me on that. So um, we decided in 2012, we undertook a journey through Europe and the Middle East, visiting churches and chapels, cathedrals and abbeys, small chapels, high holy places like Chart Cathedral, uh, obscure cave churches in Turkey. And we found enough documentation that we proposed that there was a psychedelic gospel. There was a history of sacred mushrooms in Christianity which would make sense since we've come to know these as being able to create mystical experience and be a portal uh, to the divine. So that's sort of the background. And we have had the good fortune that our book came out in 2016, just as the psychedelic renaissance was really taking off. And the um, taboos and the opprobrium that surrounded psychedelics since the uh, war on drugs and the Nixon and Reagan years was evaporating uh, before the, um, the uh, incredible clinical research that was showing their benefits, uh, that we were able to see a very wide scientific and medical audience. And we see psychedelic societies uh, springing up all over the world of, people who are interested in learning about psychedelics and exploring psychedelics in trying to commercialize psychedelics. So uh, it's been a wonderful time and we are kind of in awe and grateful for having lived long enough to see the whole pendulum swing on the issue of uh, psychedelics and to see a receptivity to our work. Great. 
And so you mentioned our golden wasson and the Amelita muscaria mushroom. And there's, there's a real history stretching back several decades, right? Or I guess over half a century now of, of ideas around the link between the Amelita and religion. Yeah, I, it even goes uh, further back than that. Well, uh, I, I think the real um, catalyst for the whole discussion came in the late 60s, early 70s. In 1968, Gordon Wasson published his masterpiece, uh, his masterwork, Soma, The Divine Mushroom of Immortality, that said that the mysterious plant god juice of the Hindu Rig Veda, the oldest of the Vedas composed in the Sanskrit about 3,500 years ago, well, and this, this was a strange plant. I mean, it had no bark, it had no leaves, it had no seeds, it had no trunk, <laughs> no branches. And um, when the Rig Veda was translated into the English and French and German scholars puzzled, what, what could this be? Because a whole, uh, one of the 10 mandalas that composed this incredible poem cycle that the Rig Veda is, over 10,000 verses, were dedicated in praise of Soma. Soma is the mainstay of the sky. Soma is the is the utter of the sky. Soma is the god for gods. Soma has taken us to immortality. And Wasson concluded that Soma was Amanita Muscaria. Uh, at the same time, uh, a noted eminent linguist and Dead Sea scholar, John Marco Allegro, uh, published a book called The Sacred Mushroom and the cross, in which he argued that Christianity was based on a mushroom cult, which Wasson disputed. He asserted that the presence of mushrooms in the Bible ended a thousand years before Christ. In other words, ended in the Old Testament, ended in Eden. Um, and they had a vigorous debate at that time. Uh, Allegro's career went down in flames for a number of reasons that I can get into, including linguists uh, tearing apart his, what was frankly shoddy linguistic evidence. And Wasson's career soared. He had been a very eminent uh, investment banker for JP Morgan, an international investment banker. And now he was retired independently wealthy and his career soared, and he's, he's recognized as a father of modern ethnomycology and also as a kind of unwitting catalyst for the psychedelic movement of, of the, uh, that, that took place in the, in the 60s and 70s. So that's where kind of uh, it all started. And uh, our book focuses around what I call a, the battle of the trees, because there's a very iconic mushroom uh, found in a small chapel in Plain Corral in France. Uh, this was a fresco painted in 1291. And Wasson, this was the only photograph Wasson used in the sacred mushroom and the cross. And he said, look, they're I'm proving it's in Christianity. This is an Amanita muscaria. And Wasson, relying on Erwin Panofsky, one of the most eminent art historians of his day at Princeton University said, no, it's a stylized Italian pine tree. Uh, so because of all the flaws in Allegro's work, he kind of lost that debate, but it has now been revived by myself, uh, by Jan Irwin, by the eminent classical scholar, Carl Rook, who with Wasson and Albert Hoffman, the discoverer, discoverer of LSD, uh, identified the secret potion in the Greek Eleusinian mysteries that were practiced for nearly 2,000 years, that that was based also, that ritual of Eleusis, the Eleusinian mysteries, was based on a LSD-like fungal growth. So this was kind of the turning point, and now we're having a vigorous wider discussion about the presence of psychedelic mushrooms 
in Christianity. And one of the things we raise in our book is why did Wasson, who was an indefatigable researcher, I mean, he pursued the mushrooms throughout Asia, Latin America, Siberia, <laughs> Europe. Why didn't he go past the portals of the, of the church? And we think we found the answer to that as well. It might be worth diving straight into uh, to that, the answer that you found. Well, uh, what some people think it was because Wasson's uh, father was a minister. Uh, we don't think so. Uh, what we found, and this was documented in a book of tributes to Gordon Wasson called The Sacred Mushroom Seeker, edited by uh, Thomas Riedlinger. And in it, Riedlinger, who wrote an essay in the, in the book, The Sacred Mushroom Seeker, was curious, why would J.P. Morgan, a prestigious, you know, white-shoed um, investment banking firm, allow Wasson to do something as uh, iconoclastic, eccentric as explore mushrooms. So he interviewed other vice presidents who worked with Wasson at J.P. Morgan, including uh, a gentleman by the name of DeWitt Peterkin. And he said, and it's quoted in the book, oh, you know, a lot of people don't know that J.P. Morgan was a banker to the Vatican. And Gordon was our representative, in fact, Gordon had meetings with the Pope. Wasson never revealed this in anything he ever wrote. And his position that there are no mushrooms in Christianity prevailed and given the preeminent authority that he had in the field, sort of put a damper on scholarly investigations into psychoactive mushrooms in Christianity for almost half a century. Um, so it's almost as if the chief climate denier turned out to be on the Exxon payroll. And it's not simply uh, a question simply of, of respect for the church, but Wasson could very well have been under, uh, as is very common in the investment banking world, confidentiality agreements, you know, not to reveal his client. So in other words, he, if, if that were the case, he would have had a real conflict of interest that should have at least been indicated in some way. Right, and so just to linger on this point for anyone who's less familiar with, with his work, you know, you have, as you say, he was a vice president um, at, at JP Morgan, this investment banking firm. He is the person who, first, the, the first Westerner to try psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico, brings them back to the West, becomes this, as you say, an eminent scholar of, of ethnomycology, use of mushrooms in, in cultures and religion, does this work, as you say, on Soma, the, you know, Rig, the Rig Veda, the oldest spiritual text we have, the, the foundations of Hinduism, whether this sacrament, and seems to suggest it could be uh, Amnita Muscaria. Um, and we also have, you know, Amnita Muscaria is still being used today, right, in Siberia. This is, this is a psychoactive mushroom that is used by people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the criticisms we make in our book of Wasson related to uh, his reluctance to move into Christianity and the devastating impact his work had on when he revealed Maria Sabina, the Mazatec shaman who invited him in the 1950s to be the first white outsiders to participate in her uh, psilocybin mushroom uh, veladas, all night ceremonies. And he promised that he would not show those photographs. And she told him that it would be una traición, you know, it would be a, it'd be a betrayal if you did. And he did it in Life Magazine, which is, you know, pick a popular magazine today. <laughs> and that was life in those days when there were very few, you know, there were not so many uh, fragments in the media world. So it devastated her life. It devastated the, the Mazatec community. Uh, they were inundated with mushroom seekers from Europe and the United States. We critique Wasson for that. That in no way takes away from the incredible work he did on Soma, uh, on documenting Mesoamerican shamanism, 
on working with Albert Hoffman and Carl Rook to unveil the Kikion potion of the Eleusinian Mysteries as a psychoactive drug, and also to document the history of the use from time immemorial until now in the present day of the Siberian reindeer herders. Uh, these are nomadic people. There's about 300,000 of them in about 30 different ling linguistic groups spread out all the way from the Nenets and from the Finnish border of Russia, all the way through central Russia and all the way uh, into uh, eastern Russia, bordering the Bering Straits, uh, Kamachkal Peninsula. Uh, and they take Amanita muscaria mushroom today as part of reindeer herder shamanism. And they're known as the, for various reasons, the fathers of, of shamanism. So this was all important work that Wasson did, including tracing the linguistic roots of the word mushroom, madness, mushroom madness, fly agaric, be mushroomed uh, into the different Siberian uh, reindeer herder languages. Visited the reindeer herders uh, today, uh, and there's you know quite a revival of interest uh, in their culture. And I'm I'm delighted to mention that two uh, Russian mycologists who are very familiar with Amanita muscaria are translating and publishing our book in Russian, uh, and it'll come out in Russian sometimes in the spring, along with Gordon Wasson and his wife, Valentina uh, Wasson's uh, first book on Russia, Mushroom, Mushroom Russia and History, which was the, the catalyst where they defined there's certain cultures that love mushrooms, like the Slavic cultures, and those are the myc mycophilic cultures. And there's certain cultures like the Germanic, Anglo, English speaking ones that are afraid of mushrooms and toadstools in the fungal world, the microphilic cultures. So this was all wrapped up in, uh, in Wasson's work. And the reindeer herders are a very prominent group of current indigenous people who use psychoactive substances in their shamanistic rituals to explore the upper world and the and the lower worlds. And I think it's worth mentioning that the um, sort of <clears throat> Amnes muscaria, also known as fly agaric, is this probably the most iconic mushroom in the world, right? You know, we see it in in fairy tales and this this red mushroom with white dots. And so that that yes. kind of it's fortunate, I guess, in the work that you've been doing, trying to identify these things in art. It's kind of um, we're not talking about an ambiguous mushroom here. We're talking about something very distinct. No. No, it's, it is probably the most uh, iconic and prominent mushroom uh, in the world. It's uh, got that, when it's mature, that red cap with the white dots. Uh, people have seen it in um, Scandinavian folk tales, in fairy uh, stories. Uh, it even makes an appearance in Walt Disney's Fantasia. And as my students are, are fond of telling me, it pops up in the Mario Brothers video games where you know, they, they get this mushroom and it gives them uh, power. So it's, it's very iconic and uh, its image is all over uh, the internet, internet. It is one of the two varieties of psychoactive mushrooms that we found in the Christian artwork. And by that I mean in frescoes, in ceiling paintings, in mosaics, in sculpture, in illuminated Bibles, and manuscripts uh, throughout uh, Europe and uh, the Middle East. The other variety we found were varieties of psilocybin mushrooms, and there are about 100 varieties of, of psilocybin mushrooms uh, throughout the world, certainly in the United States and Europe, and thanks to uh, Terence and Dennis McKenna, uh, who put out a manual on how to grow psilocybin mushrooms, they've, they've spread uh, very widely around the world. One of the unique aspects of Amanita muscaria is that the ebotenic acid and the muscimol, which are the psychoactive agents in it, do not metabolize well in the body. In other words, they're passed out through the urine. And one of the enigmas of Soma and of the Hindu Rig Veda was they talk about 
Indra, one of the gods, coming, you know, to to piss out Soma, uh, pissing it out like a stag, day and night. You have assumed your most mighty force, and Wasson, to his credit, did not simply put together footnotes and bibliography because he spent over a decade collecting manuscripts from around the world and having them translated. Soldiers of fortune, prisoners of war, Soviet uh, you know, prisoners, um, missionaries who had been to Siberia and seen the reindeer herders. And some of them described the shaman you know, climbing up the tree in his delirious state of Amanita Muscaria, coming down, emerging from his yurt, and people holding out their cups so he can urinate into it, and they drink it, and they have a psychedelic experience. So we say, yuck, that's disgusting. <laughs> uh, but this is cultural relativism. You know, different cultures have different ways of looking at things and doing things. And I think, um, and the reindeer herders uh, also carry um, urine, you know, laced with amanita in, in uh, deerskin bags so they can attract the herds back to them when they need to. And the deer go crazy over urine. All right. So I think this is one of the most compelling things that Wasson discovered because it sort of gives a biochemical basis for understanding this. And there's no other, I mean, mescaline and, and peyote, uh, psilocybin, DMT, they don't have that kind of effect. You know, they're metabolized. So you mentioned in, um, in the, the kind of artistic evidence you've been looking at, in addition to Amanita, you've also been arguing there are psilocybin mushrooms. And when I, when I, first, when I first saw the, the claim psilocybin mushrooms, I thought, well, that's a, a very generic looking little brown mushroom, right? But then there's a particular image of um, a bronze doorway that you present um, that has the, one of the most common psilocybin mushrooms in Europe is the Liberty Cup, um, which has a very distinctive, um, very distinctive look. And as soon as I saw that, I, I was I was struck. I, I understood why it was possible to argue that this this you know generic mushroom may have this chemical inside it. Um, so we may be able to jump into some of the, of the evidence. We'll, we'll try and describe it verbally, but for anyone watching visually, we'll hold up some sure. pictures as well. And, and this, is, this is an important point because, look, this is a controversial topic. Uh, Julie and I are absolutely convinced that we are correct. Uh, we hope that in time uh, our theory will be widely accepted. Uh, we hope that one day the Catholic Church will see that this was part of the original Eucharist and will reintegrate it back into Christianity to give people an authentic, direct experience of the divine. And we can kind of come back to the implications for Catholicism later. But there are kind of four levels of, of proof in this field. One is when you have an image like our green man that is a crystal clear, is so crystal clear a, uh, a depiction of an Amanita muscaria, muscaria or a psilocybin mushroom that the species can be identified. The other one, the second one is a stylized mushroom that very much looks like an Amanita or a psilocybin and also the context around it gives credence to the fact that it is a psychoactive mushroom. The third are texts that either very clearly, as in some cases we have found, or symbolically appear to refer to a psychoactive experience in the Bible. And the fourth one that's just recently emerged and been made prominent in the book by Brian Marescu, The Immortality Key, which uses archaeochemical analysis to show that there was a psychoactive ergot present in the Eleusinian mysteries in praise of Demeter and, and Persephone, the goddesses Demeter and Persephone, uh, in uh, an ancient Greek colony. And this, is, this kind of evidence was not available when Wasson uh, and early researchers were doing 
their work. So this becomes the first hard scientific evidence. Related to the Liberty Cap mushroom. So the, the uh, psilocybin mushroom is, is broad based. It has a, a, a convex cap. It has a, a broad cap. It has white uh, dots on it. It may have little clusters of Amanita growing around the base. And um, we'll get into the interpretation of this Garden of Eden scene later. By contrast, the psilocybin mushroom, which is shown here in a sculpture, a metal bronze sculpture from Hildesheim, Germany, from the Church of St. Michael's, this convex shaped psilocybin mushroom has a nipple-like top and also is striated in the sense that it has lines around the cap and layers around the cap. And this is very much characteristic of a psilocybin mushroom. What is particularly amazing, uh, this sculpture was made by Bishop Bernouard, no mar marginal figure in the Catholic Church. Uh, he was the Bishop of the Holy See of Hildesheim. He was a tutor to Otto III, the Holy Roman Emperor. He became sainted after his death by the Catholic Church. He was a church builder, a mathematician, and a metallurgist. And he made this Christ column that shows the different stages of Jesus's life from the baptism to his entry into Jerusalem. And this is an amazing scene, um, the transfiguration. It's one of two scenes in the Bible where a miracle happens to Jesus, not that a miracle that Jesus is doing. And in this particular scene, uh, Jesus is there with three of his disciples, two biblical figures appear, and the presence of God comes out luminously through the clouds. And God's voice speaks to the older prophets and to his disciples and says, this is my beloved son, hear him well. And what's amazing in this Christ column, which is about 13 feet high and three feet wide, and the images are sculpted around it in a helix that goes from the bottom, winding all the way to the top, is that in about seven of the images there, there are these very prominent Liberty Cap psilocybin mushrooms. Do you have the image? There's another, I think it's a Garden of Eden image from the same, the same church uh, with, with these Liberty Cap mushrooms. Yes, um, there are other images uh, from the church. Uh, there are, uh, Bishop Bernard was known as the millennial bishop because he lived at the thousand year mark. And, you know, people, of course, in uh, early Christian times believed that Christ was going to return in their lifetime. And he did not. And then the millennium was seen as a, a time when, yes, the, the salvation is going to come. Um, and those who have been true believers and, and lived good lives will be uh, saved. And to commemorate the millennium, uh, Bishop Renoir created this large bronze Christ column, which he had cast. And he also had two doors, uh, very large doors of bronze made for the front of the church that documented the Eden and the fall and the uh, resurrection. And again, you see this very same Liberty Cap mushroom and you see a scene from Eden and there are two caps, and then one of the caps is broken off. And God is angry, and Adam is pointing at Eve, and Eve is pointing at the serpent. So uh, you, you do see this liberty cap there. Uh, 200 years later, uh, Bishop Edward is sainted now, excuse me, and his monastic disciples painted a 90 foot long ceiling painting of the Jesse tree, you know, showing the lineage of Jesus back to the house of David and all the way through the house of uh, Jesse and, and the Israeli uh, kings. And uh, this one starts off with a bright red and white uh, mushroom cap with gold uh, dots 
on the mushroom. It is the only place in all of Christendom where the Jesse tree does not start with Jesse, but starts in Eden with a, a rondelet with a background of a giant um, red and white Amanita uh, mushroom cap. I think with um, all of these these issues of, of you know the link between psychedelics and religion, I, I remember I must have been a teenager first learning about psychedelics, and my first I remember early on my one of my first thoughts was, well, that's what the forbidden fruit is. Um, it seems so symbolic of, of um, that you're eating some natural, naturally occurring thing that makes you like a god um, from this tree of knowledge of, of life and death. So I think um, it totally makes sense that if you're going to see it anywhere, you would see it. You would see the evidence in these Garden of Eden frescoes. Yes, and and not only that. I mean, we saw that one there that I showed you in Plain Corrals. That was the point of contention between Wasson and Allegro. And we saw other mushroom images, uh, literally one five miles away from Plain Corrals in the Abbey of St. Savan. And then when we drove, Julie and I, uh, two miles east of Plain Corrals, we came to the uh, Church of St. Martin de Vic in central France. And we walked into the choir and we found um, quite a few images. And uh, Julie grabbed my arm and, and looked at this uh, fresco here. And uh, this is the scene of Jesus entering Jerusalem. And the joyful youth who are welcoming him are not holding on to a palm tree, but one of them is holding on to the stem of a plant that has five smooth conical shaped tan psilocybin mushrooms. Um, we've turned to the right in this choir part of the church and Jesus is moving right towards the towers of Jerusalem and they're painted on the top of the towers of Jerusalem are other men cutting down with a long knife, cutting through the stem of this same psilocybin mushroom plant. What's amazing about that is that this image is right over this fresco of the Last Supper. But this Last Supper is certainly not a Passover meal. There is no wine on the table. There's no bread because bread would be eaten in loaves. And you see this, what could be slices of mushroom caps with the same kind of long knives that were used on top. And Jesus has this otherworldly. Now, one can say, well, this is all kind of interesting speculation and interpretation. However, when you look down at the hems of the disciples, you see that the artist has prominently painted mushroom caps symmetrically into the hems of the disciples' robes. All of these images, photos were taken by Julie. Uh, they're in our book. And it was, James, at this moment, uh, it was getting late in the afternoon. The church bell, bell started ringing. Uh, it was very quiet. We were the only ones left in the church. There had only been one or two other visitors. And we had our aha moment. This is a psychedelic gospel. What they're showing us here is not just a scattered image. This is a Christology, part of the history of the life of Jesus with psychoactive mushrooms. And it was at this moment that we felt, yes, we have enough evidence now. We're going to propose a theory of the psychedelic gospels to say that Christianity has a psychedelic history. And this is not so surprising to find it in the art because Pope Gregory in the sixth century said, let art be the Bible of the illiterate. And throughout the Middle Ages, you know, 97, 98% of the population was illiterate. How widespread was this? 
we don't know. But it certainly was not suppressed by the church until the coming of the Inquisition, years later. We find it in early Christian art, going back as early as the 300s. We find it in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, um, 12th centuries in medieval Christian art. And this was known to the initiates and was available for people who knew, who maintained this uh, secret tradition that goes all the way back to ancient shamanism, has been found in Buddhism, has been found in Hinduism, has been found in Judaism. It doesn't mean it was the prominent tradition, but it obviously was there, uh, practiced at very least by the Christian and the pagan elite who lived side by side uh, in those particular times. We asked ourselves, look, we found this fascinating stuff here in France. Uh, is this, what is going on here? Are these just some marginal hippie priests cavorting on mushrooms in the forest, far from the control of the crown and the church? So we said, you know, no, we need to go to the high holy places of Christendom to see if we can find evidence there. So we obviously found evidence in Hildesheim with the um, Liberty Cap mushroom created by Bishop Renoir that I just showed you. We went to Canterbury Cathedral, which in the 12th century was a place where Bibles and prayer books were made. And in a magnificent illuminated prayer book called the Great Canterbury Psalter, Psalter meaning prayer book, we found these images painted as miniatures telling the story of Genesis up through the mission of Jesus uh, in the opening folio, folios of this very large prayer book. This is obviously the cover of our uh, book, the image from the cover. Uh, many of you, many, it's a very prominent image in the world of psychedelic studies. And here's Jesus, uh, God, I'm sorry, here's God creating plants. But God is not creating plants. That, that's a red and white Amanita mushroom over there on the left, at least on my left. There's a blue psilocybin mushroom. And as some of you may know, uh, when psilocybin or psilocin, the psychoactive ingredients in psilocybin mushrooms are exposed to air or oxidized, they turn blow, blue. Here are other psilocybin mushrooms, and I'm going to give you a real close-up, and you can see there are holographic tiny mushroom caps drawn right into the cap of this mushroom. In the next, very next image, where, where God is doing other things, we see green plants between these mushroom images. So the artists are saying, hey, we know the difference between plants and mushrooms. A few pages further, Jesus has been baptized by John. He's out on his healing mission. And it's interesting because a lot of Westerners, you know, go towards or seek psychedelics to find God or find the divine. What we need to remember is that one of the preeminent purposes of shamanism was to heal people. That was the, the formula of medicine in those days. And here's a famous scene in the Santa Canterbury Psalter of Jesus healing the leper. And um, a scroll is the, in Latin, tells you what they're saying. The scroll comes down from the leper's hands. And the scroll, and translating the Latin, the, the leper is saying, um, Master, uh, if you will, heal me. And the scroll from Jesus's hand, which is arcing to the leper's back, says, I, I will be cleansed. But what's fascinating here, James, is that the scroll from the leper's hand is not going to Jesus. It's going to the psilocybin mushroom at the bottom of the drawing. And Jesus is, is standing sort of suspended over the mushroom. And we believe this is the artist telling us the significance of psychoactive mushrooms, which they wouldn't have described in those words, in the healing process. 
So we found evidence not only in tiny churches and abbeys, but we also have found it in high holy places such as Canterbury Cathedral, uh, Hildesheim, and also in, uh, if I can find that image here, uh, in Chart Cathedral. As a um, as a scientist, I, I have the kind of luxury of, of having you know evidence I can play around with in the present moment. And when we turn to these kinds of these kinds of questions, we're dealing with an entirely different methodology. I'm kind of interested in, in the challenges you face in in you know how you end up proving this. You know, because once you see it in a certain way, you know you, you see this evidence through a certain lens. But presumably, you come up across people who are seeing you know without the kind of way you're looking at it and they're just not convinced you know is that the kind of is the challenge to just discuss debate and try and just move the conversation forward certainly well one of the other pieces of evidence we looked at was is there textual evidence in both the bible the old testament the new testament and also in the gnostic gospels which were the gnostics were a very prominent part of early Christianity, were then persecuted um, and their documents burned by the emerging Orthodox Church. And the Gnostic Gospels were finally uh, unearthed after being buried for centuries uh, near Nag Hammadi in Egypt, I think about the 1950s, have been translated uh, into English and are available online as the Nag Hammadi Library. And in one of the Gospels, the Gospels of Thomas, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, uh, and I'm reading, compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. And Thomas says to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Jesus says, I am not your master because you have drunk, drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring, which I have measured out. He who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I shall become he and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. I mean, this is a complete mystical experience. This is an experience of which Stanislav Grof, the founder of LSD psychotherapy, who's guided thousands of LSD trips is called dual unity, where people sharing a psychedelic experience merge completely into one another. And let's focus here. What Jesus is talking about, he's talking about a drink. And more significantly, he's talking about a drink that's measured out. And we all know that dose it's not only set your mental attitude and setting your environment, but also dose is very important. I mean, a microdose of LSD or psilocybin is subperceptual. It doesn't have any alterations of perception. And, you know, two or 300 micrograms of LSD could be a full-blown uh, psychedelic, even possibly a cosmic consciousness experience. So Jesus is talking about a dose here in which... Um, they're merging together. So we find textual evidence. Now, what we don't have, but we finally have the tools for them, are the archaeochemical evidence, which would really be the smoking gun. What the book, The Immortality Key, has revealed. Uh, Brian, the author, who was an expert in, in Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, found at a Greek colony in Spain, north of Barcelona, a, um, a shrine, a sanctuary to Demeter and Persephone, who are the goddesses worshiped in the Eleusinian mysteries. And there he found small cups and he didn't find, but the archeologists, the Spanish and Catalonian <coughs> archeologists who excavated this site put the tooth, human tooth, and the um, other uh, instruments in the sanctuary, uh, the cups, through archaeochemical analysis, which is done in Berlin, which is done at MIT, which is done at the University of Pennsylvania, 
where now these very sophisticated uh, spectroscopy tools can detect what kind of biological or chemical material remains as a residue, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years later. And that becomes the smoking gun. We do not have that for the Eucharist or for early Christian practices, either from the relics, certainly not yet from the Vatican, or from the, um, the, the graveyards, the sepulchers, um, the catacombs that dot Rome. But um, we now have the tools to maybe come up with that uh, smoking gun. But look, let's think about this for a moment. Jesus and Christianity emerged in a circum Mediterranean region that was rife with Egyptian, Greek, Jewish, mystical and mystery cults, Gnostic Christianity, some of which overtly and others which covertly used psychedelic potions. So it is not out of the question that the early Christians would have had a direct experience of God as part of the early Eucharist. And think about how powerful that would be, how incredibly powerful that would be. And that's what gives people um, such a connection and such an enthusiasm for psychedelics. I mean, for Julie and me, starting out back in the 60s and 70s, uh, being, you know, maybe agnostic, not being uh, part of any organized religion, psychedelics gave us our first experience of God or the divine as this presence that permeates the entire universe. And this I know as strongly as I know anything. This is why Stanislav Grof, after guiding thousands of LSD trips, said, look, we are not just chemical bio computers, you know, these incredible brains of ours. We are fields of consciousness, vast and limitless. And psychedelics opens up the doorways to experience uh, those particular fields of consciousness. Uh, unlike Allegro, we do not see our work as something to liberate people from the thrall of a, a false Christianity. There's a lot of good in all religions. And as Brother David Stendhal Rost, uh, a Benedictine monk, who we quote in our book said, if I can experience God through a sunrise on a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom, prayerfully ingested? In other words, that's the end of the quote. But these are all God's creations. These are all God's creations. So we see with someone like Maria Sabina, after 300 years of Spanish colonialism, is invoking both her Mazatec ancestry and invoking Jesus and the saints in her chants, in the healing chants that um, she uses uh, in her in her healing uh, ceremonies in Veladas. So we hope that that look. It took the Christian Church 300 years to apologize to Galileo. We hope it won't take them that long uh, to to recognize that entheogenic mushrooms that open up a portal to the divine could be a part of resacralizing people's experience of the divine within Christianity. There, there's an irony here, James, that right now it's the scientists in the laboratories using synthetic psilocybin who are occasioning, creating mystical experience, not the rabbis, priests, or leaders of other religious faiths. So I think you mentioned um, John Marco Allegro, and it's worth differentiating your position from his because he had this rather extreme position, right? The, that Jesus never existed, and it's all a cover story for this fertility cult that worships the Amnita muscaria mushroom, which is a pretty out there idea that I, I don't know anyone who ascribes to that, to that these days. Uh, there are a few people who have tried to resurrect Allegro's work, but I, I just, uh, I don't think it's, it's gonna stand the test of time. 
Uh, this is not to take away from the fact that he was a brilliant Dead Sea scholar, scholar and was one of the people who worked on translating the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> but we disagree. We admire him for his courage in talking about the entheogenic origins of religion. And here he agreed with Wasson. But we disagree, Julie and I, with John Marco Allegro. We are definitely not his disciples. And we spell this out um, very clearly in our book. We disagree with John Marco Allegro in three ways. Number one, he does not believe that Jesus was a historical figure. We believe that Jesus absolutely was a, an historical figure. Number two, he bases his theories on dubious linguistic evidence, where we base our theories on plausible and at times very specific, identifiable mushroom images in Christian art. And number three, uh, Allegro, you know, overtly had it in for the Catholic Church. He wanted to liberate people from the thrall of what he saw was a false religion. We want to, um, you know, reveal what we believe is the truth at the foundation of many religious uh, practices. And we hope one day that um, religions will embrace psychedelics. Look, there's over 20% of the population in the United States who are unaffiliated religiously now. Uh, many of these people call themselves spiritual, but not religious. And when you look at the youth, the boomers, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, not the millennials, you know, that number goes up to 30% who are not religiously affiliated. But people are looking for purpose, they're looking for meaning, they're looking for man's place and woman's place in the universe. And I think psychedelics offers them and if it wouldn't be too audacious or presumptuous, I think we're seeing, and this is where, you know, I'm definitely engaging in speculation now, uh, but I think we're seeing the glimmerings of an entheogenic reformation that could become in time as powerful as the Protestant reformation was when it took place in, in 1517. Um, you know, about five, you know, just about 500 years ago. Yeah, he is hoping that that's a wonderful vision for the future. And um, well, thank you so much for your time, Jerry. This has been wonderful. Um, do you have a website or anywhere you would direct people to if they want to yes. look into your work more? Uh, absolutely. Uh, our website is very simple. It's www.psychedelicgospels.com. One word, psychedelicgospels.com. We post a lot on our Facebook page, Psychedelic Gospels. Uh, I'm teaching an online course on psychedelics and culture that's open to people. It's for three university credits. Uh, it is a, it's a fee-based course uh, at my uh, university in Florida, Florida International University. If anyone is interested in learning about this course, which starts on January 11th, 2021, you can email me at jb brown j b b r o w n at gate.net or if you have any questions about our work julie and i would be happy to to answer them great thank you so much for your time this has been wonderful it's a pleasure thank you so much james for having us and uh, happy holiday to you and all of your listeners <laughs>